Well, good evening and welcome to this book launch for this fascinating book, a collection of essays edited by Shreya Atre and Peter Dunn on intersectionality and human rights law. My name is Kate Regan. I'm the director of the Bonavera Institute and this event has been co-hosted by the Bonavera Institute and the Oxford Human Rights Hub. And we have with us as one of the co-contributors to the um, collection, Sandy Fredman, who's the director of the Human Rights Hub, as well as Megan Campbell. Um, so we're really delighted to be having this conversation. Um, we are fortunate that we have all the contributors to the book, each of whom will speak briefly on the panel about their contribution and about their thinking around the topic of intersectionality and human rights law. Um, and so the process for the evening will be for each of them to speak with a short concluding remarks by Peter Dunn, and then we will turn to questions and answers. For those of you who are not sure where to find it, the question and answer button is at the foot of your screen on the right hand side. Please feel free to ask any questions you like and I'll moderate them to the panel once they finish their presentations. So the concept of intersectionality is one of those concepts which immediately when explained to one seems extraordinarily illuminating. It seems to tell one something very important about how the world is. But I think what this volume illustrates is that it's very much more difficult to work out what it actually means both in theory and in practice once you've got past the Im immediate sense of illumination. As Shreya Atre puts in her in introductory chapter, uh, is it a theory? Is it an idea? Is it a concept? Is it a heuristic? It's very difficult to know. And I think these uh, contributions to the book explore exactly how the idea of uh, intersectionality works in practice in six very different areas of human rights law. So I'm sure that the authors are going to give us insights today on this rather vexing concept of intersectionality and how it can improve our understandings of human rights law in theory, but perhaps more importantly in practice. So we'll start then with uh, Shreya Atre, who wrote the first chapter of the book, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Shreya. Thanks, thanks so much, Kate. So in the next um, eight minutes that I have, I want to do three things. So I want to quickly convey um, a set of thanks, first of all, to Bonavero um, and to Kate in particular for hosting us today and uh, for chairing this panel. Thank you so much as well to Gayatri uh, for setting this up. Um, it's, it's wonderful to, to be uh, remote and online, one of the silver linings of, of uh, being being in the, in the pandemic, I see so many familiar names uh, for people joining from uh, ar around the world, really. Uh, so whatever time you're at, thank you so much for making time for us. We, we, re we really appreciate it and warm welcome to everyone who's joining today. Thank you so much as well to Sandy and Megan uh, and for co-hosting uh, Oxford Human Rights Hub um, this, this, this event. We really appreciate it and thank you always for supporting. Uh, scholarship which is which is less traditional marginal and and for, for being part of this really appreciate it uh thanks as well to all the authors who are able to join we'll be hearing from all of them uh other than fiona delondres who is unable to join today uh but it, it'll be great for everyone uh to get a, a glimpse of the chapters in the book from the authors so thank you so much for for, for everyone who's joined today as the author of, as as the co as 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 the, as the authors of the chapters, we're really grateful for you ha to having contributed to the book and for being here today. Uh, thank you to Peter uh, for being a co-conspirator and and for being a co-editor on 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 the book. Um, Peter, your incredible can-do spirit really makes things happen, and I'm glad we could uh, get get this project uh, um, up and up and running. And I think. Uh, I'll say a bit more about this, but uh, the 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 aim of this project was really uh, not to close off any conversations, but to really inaugurate a conversation which we think was was lacking. And and so so it it, it really did uh, did uh, require a bit of leap of faith to take with someone. So so Peter did take that, and I really appreciate that. Uh, so thank you, and thanks to everyone in the audience again. Uh, re really appreciate your time. So that's that's the first thing. The second thing I want to do is just to say briefly what the book is about and what the project behind the book um, really is. And I'm going to pick up on where Kate left in terms of intersectionality seems to be accessible. It seems to be a buzzword. You go on Twitter, it's 
It's being used. It's a hashtag left, right, center. It's been used by Beyonce, Hillary Clinton. Everybody seems to love the word, but it's really hard to get to grips with what is going on with the concept. Uh, I'm just going to quickly read out one of the quotes that that we bring up in in the book, which really I think summarizes what we are trying to do. So this is a quote from Patricia Hill Collins, who's one of the chief. Uh, writers on intersectionality theory. Um, and she says, intersectionality is far broader than what most people think, including many of its practitioners, what, it, what they imagine it to be. We have yet to fully understand the potential of the constellation of ideas that fall under the umbrella term intersectionality as a tool for social change. And I think that really it was the cue for us to think of intersectionality as something not yet fully understood. And the purpose for us, as uh, so many of us um, on, on, on this book are, we are, we are discrimination lawyers. So for, for some of us, intersectionality was something which we knew as equality discrimination lawyers, as something bringing up, brought up in our uh, field as thinking about how discrimination transpires on more than one ground. So if you're black and if you're a woman, you draw on intersectionality theory to reveal exactly what the nature of discrimination there is. But we didn't quite know as human rights lawyers what the, what the usefulness of intersectionality is in human rights law. So as human rights lawyers, as, 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 as a field existing, um, as, as a field which is bigger than uh, equality and discrimination law. So equality and discrimination law, I would imagine as a subset of the field of human rights law, we were concerned about why does it seem that intersectionality is, is it's such a wide ranging concept, but it seems to be limited within the human rights field to equality and discrimination law. So we wanted to quite understand why Intersectionality, although it has had a vast purchase in other fields and disciplines, sociology, economics, political science, political theory, it, it seems to have only been developed in equality and discrimination law. And we can understand why this has been the case, given the fact that intersectionality as, as a term was coined in the context of discrimination law by Kimberly Crenshaw. But it seemed that given the way that intersectionality has been developed and employed, it's grown wider in almost every other context other than human rights law. So we wanted to kind of understand why that was the case and then to apply intersectionality to our many discourses that we come from, civil political rights, socioeconomic rights, but as well as thinking about the theory of human rights law and what it does to thinking about intersectionality. So that's that's one of the big motivations of, of, of bringing this, this project together. Um, the second thing I think which, which brought the project together, and I just want to give two examples here to understand what I mean by understanding intersectionality theory in human rights law, was to think about um, what is the difference between human rights um, to be violated or to be realized um, or on an, without discrimination versus the right to non-discrimination, which is an individual right. So for a template for the audience, it might be useful to take you from say the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So on the one hand, you're thinking about article two, paragraph one, which talks about the rights in the covenant should be realized on a non-discriminatory basis. That's what we were thinking about and we wanted to distinguish it from the individual self-standing right against discrimination under Article 26. So we wanted to see the connection between identities, especially intersectional identities, and how human rights are realized or violated, but not really go down the route of the individual human rights route, specifically the individual right to non-discrimination. So we wanted to focus on, on individual rights and see how they could be infiltrated with intersectionality rather than just focusing on the right to equality and non-discrimination. And to give a second example to, it, to further exemplify what I've just said, I think what, what might be a useful thing to, to keep in, in mind or to have as a reference is the Grenfell Fire tragedy, which Geraldine has written so um, wonderfully in the book. Um, but, but I'm just gonna give Grenfell as an example um, at, at the start to just give a, a bit of an anchor to this conversation in terms of thinking about why 
Is it that rights seem to be violated on an intersectional basis and why that it doesn't seem to be captured by the right to non-discrimination? So I think if you have to see the Grenfell fire tragedy, I think one way to see it would be to imagine it as a violation of the right to life or even the right to housing. And it's, it's useful to think about who exactly lost their life or whose right to housing or home was at stake. So the Grenfell residents were, according to data published in 2015, amongst the top 10% of the most deprived sections in the country, despite being nestled in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods, Kensington, Kensington and Chelsea in London. So it's clear that everybody who lost their life, 78, um, 72 people, according to official statistics, was, was poor and deprived in a socioeconomic sense. But there's something else about Grenfell. There's something quite interesting happening in terms of who um, was the victim in Grenfell. So Grenfell's victims were overwhelmingly poor. They were black, Muslims, first generation immigrants, refugees, and many of them were inhabiting several of these categories at the same time. So amongst those who died, 18 were children, including one stillborn infant, seven were persons with disabilities, and the number of women who died outnumbered men. People from 19 other nationalities lost their lives alongside seven white Britons, and over 20 non-white British people. 21 were from Africa and 15 from Middle East and Asia. And there were diverse professionals who lost their lives in Grenfell, artists, chefs, chambermaids, electricians, retailers, waiters, taxi drivers, lorry drivers, porters. Um, the, the reason for bringing this diversity of identities in, Gren in Grenfell fire um, is interesting to think about because it shows us that the profile of the victims has something to say about whose rights gets violated. And I think our hypothesis in the book, which sort of propelled the research of the book, was that if rights seem to be violated on an intersectional basis, what does it really mean? Could we have a test of intersectional violations and, and, and what, what could possibly be done about that? I'm just going to close by saying the last thing that I wanted to say. I think when we started the project, it seemed like this is going to be a, a pie in the sky thing. It's, it's blue sky thinking. We would want intersectionality to have greater purchase in human rights law, but who really is going to take the bait that, that, that human rights law should, should look at intersectionality as a general theory? Well, the good news is that as always, the South African Constitutional Court seems to have taken the bait and they seem to have gone on using intersectionality as a general theory of interpretation in its decision from November last year, November 2020, which is the Mahalangu decision. And they seem to have used intersectionality to adjudicate not just on the right to non-discrimination under section nine of the constitution, but in particular section, uh, sorry, section um, nine of the constitution, but also section 10, which is on the right to dignity, as well as section 27 on the right to accessing social assistance. So both of those other rights, other than the right to non-discrimination, seem to have used intersectionality in either of the two ways. One, the court seemed to have understood the case of um, the, the violation of the rights of uh, domestic workers, particularly in reference to the intersectional category of poor black women who, ha who happen to be overwhelmingly inhabiting the category of domestic workers. So domestic workers in South Africa happen to be poor black women and this court is very particular about just using them as the category for thinking about how rights have been violated, including the right to dignity and the right to social assistance. The second way in which the court seems to have brought up intersectionality as a general tool, it seems to be as an evaluative tool. So proof of intersectional um, violation seems to have lent itself to proving not just the right to non-discrimination, but the right to violate, the right to dignity, as well as the right to um, social assistance. So it seems that you can bring up intersectional evidence or the, or the evidence in relation to violation of rights of intersectional groups as something to be proving that it is a general right which is being violated of these people. So it seems that there is, there is hope for this kind of research to take off. And I think we seems to, we seem to have uh, inaugurated a conversation which I hope really thrives um, in, 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 in the coming years. And, and we hope that 
for for all for a lot of you who are listening to this conversation you hope this you take this research uh, further ahead and and find ways of making best use of it uh, in 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 your own work so thank you so much uh, for joining us we hope you find the book useful if, if you get a chance to to get your hands on it thanks so much kate thanks very much rare and so I'm going to turn now to Gautier de Beko, who wrote in the book about disabled children's rights to education. Gautier. Uh, yes, good evening, everybody. Do you hear me, please? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I uh, just two things. The, the first one is that I actually I use disabled children as an illustration to um, my general question, uh, which is how to harness disability, uh, sorry, um, uh, intersectionality theory. Uh, uh, to give it more potential, to give international human rights law more potential. The second thing is, may, may I, I'll, I'll be part of a little PowerPoint to help uh, the audience and myself as well. Can I share it? Yes, uh, yes, you can. I'm just making sure that you are a co-host so that we can do that. Just one more sec. Uh, yes, you should be able to do so. I think. Share screen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, so as as I said, well, I I I, I first of, of all before starting, and I promise, I see the time. I will be shorter than eight minutes. I know there are other speakers after me, and I'm also looking forward to listening to them, so I will be very careful. And of course, the first thing I want to do, uh, uh, and this is sincere, uh, I want to thank the, the both uh, Shreya and Peter for first having invited me, I think it's two years ago, to this seminar in Bristol. Uh, and, and, and I must say that it was a, a very good starting point, because I, I had started to, to, to work on intersectionality, and, and, and I came with more questions and answers, and, and some even doubts. Uh, about what we could still do with, with it. And I must say that it stimulated me uh, to work on the chapter. So congratulations to them. Uh, without further ado, I move in uh, uh, to my discussion. And as you see the title, what I've tried to do is, is two things. First, to basically m move this discussion uh, ahead as, as started by, by Shreya and see what in international human rights that we can do with this intersectionality. What has been done and what we could do better and what it could bring. And, I, and, and since I'm, I'm, I find still that it often remains very abstract, I try to show this through an illustration, uh, which is uh, something I know a bit well because I've been working on it. Uh, it's the, the right to education of disabled children. And, and it's just to show that it may work, what I meant. And, and I hope the, the, the message got through. But and I see other people have done the same things, and I'm very happy that we 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 managed that, that we managed to, to to make it concrete. So my question is there: How to harness the full potential of intersectionality in the field of international human rights law? That's the basic question. And there is a bit of a journey here that I noted for the last years is that uh, um, now both in terms of case law, but that's recent, but all in terms of research. The, the, the concept of intersectionality has, has been used in the field of international human rights law. And that's a positive thing because it, it remains uh, um, a bit uh, well cornered in, in that of anti-discrimination law. However, and that's maybe where the, the issue is, and, and it's normal. It's nothing to do with, with, with uh, it's a limitation perhaps of, of international human rights law as such, that we have uh, focused, the focus has shifted from multiple grounds, disability, gender, sexual orientation, two subgroups. Well, in my, you know, I, I work on disability. Well, disabled women, disabled children, disabled LGBTQ people, and you can multiply this. And that's what is happening currently. Um, when when you read a lot of, of UN documentation, well, you, you find an addition and the list becomes longer and longer. Is that what we uh, uh, mean by it? And as, as I said, well, in a way, it's, it's not, uh, bad faith, or it's not a, a problem that is so easily uh, evitable. We should meet, be able to mitigate that problem, but it's in part due because because there has a, been a battle at the uh, at the universal level to get a number of group specific human rights treaty. The battle is not over, by the way, uh, and a number of groups categories have managed to have a treaty for their own. 
including uh, disabled people. And, and by building a number of, of, of treaties, there are separate legal regimes, se separate areas of specialism as well, that revolve around these identities. Um, but of course, when we, do, we think about disability or gender, we, we think about the mainstream disability, the mainstream, and, and, and we don't think about the way in which this, is, this can be articulated in multiple of ways. And the, all, the best, the way that is usually applied to take into account intersectionality so far, well, is to aggregate those, as I said just before. And the question here, is this a correct application of intersectionality or, or uh, is this not, is a, a, I wouldn't say an oversimplification, but, but just a bit of a, of a repetition of what we've seen in anti-discrimination law, but then just apply to groups of people rather than focusing on grounds. Whereas, and well, I have the book in front of me, and I had this discussion, by the way, with with um, uh, with Freya, because I think that's we, we have been discussing the chapter. That, that's that's the whole point. Wh whether this really reflects what intersectionality was was about, uh, whether this focuses enough on uh, all, all the forms of oppressions that happen when in, in identities intermesh and interact with each other, uh, and and that requires us to focus on systems of disadvantage rather than to say, well, uh, if you have uh, 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 disabled people and, and women, and you put a subcategory. Well, that's what human rights should say. It, it goes further than than that. We have to look at 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 how how both identities create systems of oppression, uh, which are specific uh, to those situations. So, and my uh, suggestion was then to to try to move away from this identitarian understanding of intersectionality and to move to a system based. Uh, understanding uh, of intersectionality, where uh, the starting point is not the different identities, but a system which, when you articulate or you look at different identities that create these advantages within a particular area of life, raise new questions that might affect a group or another or different groups in different ways, uh, rather than, uh, 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 how to say, aggregating or multiplying different identities to ident identify a multiple of subgroups. Um, uh, which not only is endless, but which is perhaps, well, which is even impossible uh, in the end, because uh, we are all different. Um, so, as I said, then the focus would be on the structures of disadvantages. And something that, that I think in that case is that in the end, what the advantage we would have there is that rather than starting from the point of the legal text of, of any treaty or, or the, uh, the, the abstract understanding of a right, we will focus on the experience first. Well, if we note that identities affect the, the, the experience of human rights and as uh, all identities uh, uh, will, uh, will, make, this will make it varied and require different responses, as I try to show in education. As I know the time is more or less up, I will just leave, I can share my slides. Uh, I will not finish my PowerPoint presentation. I, I've been uh, 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 too ambitious uh, in terms of slides, but if you see what I propose, what well, is that? I try to show this in my in my own way that we need to have, and I, I, that's a rejoinder to what I've been said. To have, we need to use it as an interpretation tool rather than than just a way to divide up rights or different categories. Uh, and I agree with that. And I would a kind of intersectional reading of human rights, as I try to do with disabled children, should show that we would not just apply any treaty from the perspective of that treaty at the CAPD from the perspective of disability or the CAC from the perspective of childhood, but try to, how, how together they address different systems of disadvantage. And, and I want to, to finish with something that, 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 that's, that, that's, that's maybe, is maybe related, is that in the end, it might, using that, might tell us more about the legal subject in, in uh, uh, international human rights law, which is, has often been detached from uh, experience and, and seen in a very abstract way, uh, away from all uh, these identities. Uh, and, and, and that can make perhaps the legal subject more concrete, uh, uh, paradoxically, by focusing away from the identities and rather on systems. So thank you very much. I hope I have kept the, the, the instruction to stay in within eight minutes. And again, it was a joy to participate in this, in this book. And I'm very grateful to uh, the organizer of the conference and to the editors. Thank you. Thanks, Gautier, for, for sticking to time and for introducing us to this very interesting idea of using 
the structures of disadvantage as the way, as the kind of theoretical way of thinking about intersectionality. I'm sure we'll come back to that in Q&A later. I'm now going to turn to uh, Kalamo Kineva. Great, thank you, Kate. And uh, thank you to Shreya and Peter for uh, putting together a wonderful conference on this in Bristol back in 2018. It suddenly seems a, a very long time ago, pre-COVID and for doing a wonderful job with the edited volume and for being patient with me, the most important role of any editor. Um, in these comments, I'm going to try and do what I think is often quite good at a book launch, which is not bore you senseless with the uh, finer points of my fabulously sophisticated or nuanced argument, uh, but just to sort of give you um, a taster of um, my chapter and also to give you uh, a very, very brief um, sense of why I think the book is very important, not necessarily my chapter, but the book as a whole. Um, when Shreya and Peter sent me an invitation for the book, uh, I was very excited um, because it, 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 it seemed to me that the idea of a book on intersectionality and human rights was hitting a vast open gap in the market. Um, let me explain what I mean by that very briefly. For those of us who are sort of professional anti-discrimination lawyers, experts, people in our circles have been talking about intersectionality since Kimberly Crenshaw wrote her famous uh, uh, article on the topic in the late 1980s. It's a buzzword in anti-discrimination circles. I remember 15 years ago when I was starting my academic career, being in a hotel room in Brussels with lots of people all over the EU, with various people uh, forcing the text of the EU Race Equality Directive to see could you get multiple ground protection. It was highly technical, highly, um, highly abstract sometimes, but very much a sort of a, a, a technical concept. Um, since then, of course, intersectionality has exploded as a concept in all sorts of weird and mutant ways. I, I, I saw it referred to in the New York Times yesterday as, as, as there being, well, I, I saw in the New York Times yesterday, there was such a thing called the Church of Intersectionality, which is apparently all dominant across the uh, liberal left cultural domination of the Anglo-American world. Which is uh, which is interesting, um, but so it's become a it's moved from these very narrow origins to the sort of sort of this vague amorphous concept getting thrown around in debate. Um, but one thing where I think it hasn't been discussed is that it, what's happened to intersectionality is that's often got caught in this gap between its its status as a technical concept, an identified problem in the framework of equality law and this wider amorphous term, which has become a catch-all category for all sorts of vague, diffuse ideas. And, and, and part of what's caught, been caught in that gap is there's been a lack of serious engagement as to what intersectionality as a concept may mean for human rights adjudication. And I've, 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 I've had a personal interest in this going back a decade. Um, when I was a member of the European Commission on Social Rights, I remember being in a meeting room in Strasbourg one day, adjudicating a collective complaint brought to us by NGOs under the Collective Complaints Protocol to the European Social Charter, European Roma Rights Centre versus Bulgaria, a case mentioned in my book chapter involving sweeping US style welfare cuts in, in Bulgaria. And being challenged on the basis it had a disproportionate impact upon the Roma population in Bulgaria. And it occurred to me as we debated this case that what we are doing is intersectionality. We are engaged in intersectionality analysis. We are looking at the intersection of social rights, protected in the European Social Charter, with equality non-discrimination rights, in particular the race discriminate the, the, the race equality rights of Roma and, and, and women and disabled and other disadvantaged minorities. Um, and this got me thinking because I realized that we were doing intersectionality without the concept being named or being in any way discussed. And there was a hole in the academic literature. There was very little to help those of us engaged in human rights adjudication as opposed to distinct equality and anti-discrimination adjudication, dealing with these concepts of intersectionality. Since then, intersectionality has begun to mushroom in human rights case law in various parts of the world. Shreya has mentioned the judgments that South African Constitutional Court recently, but interestingly, in different forms, 
often with the term intersectionality not being used, it is increasingly being deployed in human rights adjudication. In my chapter, I discuss how the European Court of Human Rights, using the concept of special group vulnerability, has, develop, has now developed quite a sophisticated set of case law discussing how, for example, privacy and family rights under Article 80 CHR may have particular application and may generate particular positive obligations upon states when it comes to particularly vulnerable groups who suffer overlapping forms of social exclusion. Now, what's happening there is that that's an intersectionality analysis. It's been branded under the phrasing of vulnerability. And as my chapter points out, there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting set of issues to unpick there about the, any differences that might exist between vulnerability and intersectionality. But the point, for, the, the only point I want to make now is that the, these forms of intersection analysis are happening, often in embryonic form, but they are happening in legal systems all across the world, even if they aren't stamped with the intersectionality brand. And um, those of you who know the Article 14 jurisprudence of, under the Human Rights Act of the UK courts in relation to various legal challenges over the last 10 years to austerity measures, cases like SD, Rutherford, JD, will know what I'm talking about challenges to austerity measures um, framed in terms of sex discrimination, disability discrimination challenges. But what's going on is that you have legal challenges addressing indivi vulnerable individuals caught up in the overlap of different forms of social exclusion, different discriminatory patterns, poverty combining with gender, combining with special vulnerability, like being a victim of domestic violence, combining with disability to produce particular classes with the law attempting often and struggling, but trying to deal with these particular vulnerabilities. So intersectionality is happening, even if it's not necessarily being branded as such. And this is why this book is tremendously important, because it tries to come to grips with these issues. Um, in my chapter, very briefly, I summarise why I think intersectionality is integral to any form of social rights adjudication broadly defined, whether directly concerned with social rights or a sort of Article 14 ECHR style analysis that in some ways dealing through ECHR rights with various issues related to access to social welfare. Um, I saw a statistic the other day, the, the, the majority of users of um, the majority of people accessing um, emergency food assistance in the UK are, is, are, are disabled, for example, have a registered disability of some description or another. You can't talk about poverty in the UK without talking about gender, without talking about ethnicity, without talking about disability, without talking about age. So the, all this is a classic example how if social rights adjudication is to be meaningful, it needs to engage with these intersectional dimensions. And my experience as, as, as an adjudicator dealing with the European um, social charter mechanism was that cases inevitably tend to have an intersectional dimension. Intersectionality is, if you want, locked into the DNA of social rights adjudication, is an unavoidable part of it, and is a very important part of it, because it's only with a sort of an, an, an awareness of intersectionality that, that you, can, you can sort of unpick the, the exclusions that make up violations of social rights. In the chapter, I do point out that there are potential issues with obsessing about particular approaches to um, intersectionality. I, 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 I discuss potential dangers and concerns about over-egging the intersectionality pudding in certain contexts in, in the specific framework of social rights adjudication. But you can read the chapter for those academic quibbles. The key takeaway point, intersectionality is all around. It's an integral part of any form of social rights adjudication broadly defined. And it's an enormously important analytical tool for any serious legal engagement with these issues through human rights law frameworks. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Callum. Very interesting to have the focus on the adjudicative um, way of thinking about the problem. Now we're going to turn to Sandy, uh, Sandy Fredman. Um, hi, everyone. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. And thanks so much. I'm really glad to be here. And thanks particularly to Shreya and Peter for uh, orchestrating this extremely important project, which I'm very glad to be on and to Kate for 
hosting and chairing. So in, in my chapter, I hone in on a particular right, the right to education, and look at how an intersectionality analysis can enrich our, um, our application of that right. So if you look at the right to education, it's absolutely glaring how the promise that everyone has the right to education falls so far short of the reality. And those that are excluded from quality education um, or any education are predominantly those who we can see have intersectional identities, um, racialized people, girls and women, people with disabilities, poor people, and often all of those uh, at once. Um, and this is particularly important because, as we know, education is a multiplier right. Um, without the right to education, we often can't enjoy any of the other rights, like freedom of speech, um, freedom of uh, assembly. And it's also an accelerator right, which helps people get on in life and, and improve. So it traps, without education, people are trapped in a vicious cycle of poverty and deprivation. And this intersectional lens shows how all of these identities don't, are not just additive, as Gautia said, but create a particular synergy of um, disadvantage and exclusion. Um, and this is particularly shown, as I show in my chapter, by looking at the way the right to education has been adjudicated in two jurisdictions, which I look at, the US and South Africa. Uh, in the US, as we know, right to education was initially litigated entirely in terms of race discrimination. The Brown versus Board of Education case um, held that racial segregation in schools was unconstitutional, but really ignored entirely the other aspects of the identity of um, young black learners, that is their poverty, their disadvantage, um, and their exclusion from many parts of society. And the result of that was that in due course, um, the disadvantage uh, reasserted itself um, in terms of patterns of segregation, geographical segregation, um, patterns of housing, low tax revenues, which exacerbate poor access to the right to education. And when in a case like the Seattle case, the um, authority tried to see race as a proxy for disadvantage, the court then turned around and struck it down as saying we cannot actually adjudicate, um, we cannot actually allow preference or racial reallocation because this goes against our constitutional uh, requirement. So that led litigators to turn around and start a separate stream of litigation, which didn't go for race, but went for only for poverty and disadvantage. But, and those cases were quite successful at state level, but by leaving out the racial aspect, by leaving out the true intersectionality of it, um, those cases simply ignore the fact that this disadvantage is concentrated in predominantly black inner city disadvantaged uh, areas, which then um, show in the figures that um, school results are highly racialized. Um, and in South Africa, we see a similar but kind of opposite pattern that, as we know, apartheid um, distinguished or established education entirely on the basis of race um, and the racial distinctions then entrenched poverty and disadvantage. But since uh, the new constitution, the, um, the court cases have been primarily on the right to education rather than, uh, which focuses on disadvantage in education rather than the racialized aspect. Um, and when race comes in, it's really often just in attention, for example, uh, Afrikaans speaking schools, the right to Afrikaans language as against uh, the right uh, of, of poor excluded black students. And also I look at the, the gendered nature when we add gender into that, particularly in relation to um, pregnant learners who are excluded from school, we see that the exclusion of pregnant learners 
from the right to education is uh, more than just an addition of gender, race, and disadvantage. It's something quite specific about the way in which uh, these particular axes of, of discrimination interact with each other. So what I argue in my chapter is that if we are really going to try to fulfill this promise that everyone has the right to education, we need to see it from an intersectionality perspective. And to do that, I use um, my four dimensional approach to, um, to substantive equality, which actually works particularly well for um, intersectionality claims. And these four dimensions are redressing disadvantage, um, addressing stigma and stereotyping, facilitating voice and addressing structural issues which uh, entrench, sorry, inequality. Um, so if we look at, and these have to be all addressed together cumulatively so that we can't just look at the redressing disadvantage without recognizing the stigma that can sometimes come together with measures which are addressed entirely to redressing disadvantage. But redressing disadvantage allows us to take an intersectionality lens because we look at the most disadvantaged, the pregnant learners who are the ones who are excluded because of their gender, um, because of their race and their poverty. We look also at uh, the, the second the sti stigma and um, prejudice because why are, what is it about pregnancy among young adolescent women which leads to this exclusion. It's the stigma and the stereotyping based on their, their gender. Um, the third dimension, which is facilitating voice. Again, for um, the, once we have an intersectional lens on the right to education, we can see that exclusion from the political sphere, exclusion even from the, the immediate sphere of having a voice in your immediate community, then compounds both the disadvantage and the stigma and the stereotyping and vice versa. And lastly, and this is my last point, um, the, it's important to see that all of these things need to be addressed, not just by individual claims of the right to education or indeed individual claims of discrimination against a perpetrator, but by recognizing the structural issues the housing segregation, the, um, the stigma, stigmatic way in which um, taxes and different distributive issues are allocated, um, the lack of voice in order to make sure that we really do see that the right to education is properly um, enjoyed by everyone. So thank you very much and thanks for listening and for giving me an opportunity to be part of this conversation. Uh, thanks very much, Sandy. And um, now we're going to turn to Geraldine. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Shreya and Peter, for inviting me to be part of what I think is a significant uh, piece of work. Uh, and also to Kate and the Bonavira and to Sandy and the Oxford Human Rights Hub for hosting this. Um, my chapter focuses on what dares not speak its name in international, regional, and in many national human rights laws, and that is class discrimination. My central argument is that class, which is richly intersectional, has been ill served by intersectionality at a theoretical and at a practical remedial level. And by class, I mean a richly diverse, multidisciplinary, multi multidimensional concept of class, which embraces all religions, all races, genders, and all other aspects of the protected characteristics, and also includes things that have been ignored uh, largely by uh, human rights law and equality laws, and that is rurality, as well as, as we've seen in Grenville Tower, uh, characteristics such as uh, refugee and asylum status. Historically, we did have laws on class, but they were exclusionary rather than inclusionary. I'm arguing that an express prohibition on class discrimination is necessary because of the failures of inter intersectionality, that it requires urgency and would be a unifying factor reinforcing existing legal prohibitions on discrimination. But there is a nervousness about class, firstly because it's coupled with autocracy and revolution, the Chinese uh, constitution, 
which protects the uh, China under the People's Democratic Dictatorship led by the working class is not the approach that I'm suggesting. But I argue that class discrimination can be resolved peacefully and democratically. So Cyprus prohibits class discrimination. Uh, India, in language which I'm not comfortable with, but has expressed constitutional references to backward classes, albeit to, re to reverse such discrimination. And in South Africa, which does not prohibit class discrimination expressly in the constitution, but the Equality Court in the uh, Social Justice Coalition and Minister of Police case said that although poverty was not listed as a ground of discrimination, it did amount to unfair discrimination, including because poverty was analogous to social origin. And uh, Kalisha, which is where the, uh, which is Rosa for uh, our home, uh, is where the uh, case took place because of lack of police protection and the majority of people living in Kalisha uh, are black South Africans. So we see that intersectionality um, approaching there as well. So we've seen different constitutional uh, approaches, peaceful ones, alternatives to uh, revolution and anti-democratic approaches. Secondly, there's a nervousness about class discrimination because of the challenges of definition. It's said that class is too broad to define. Now, the definitional problem is always used by those who seek to retain the status quo and obstruct progress in human rights. So when we were drafting the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, we were told it was impossible to define a child. Now it's become the most widely ratified human rights treaty and the definitional problems were overcome. Thirdly, there's a notion and a nervousness about prohibiting class discrimination because of its fluidity. However, human rights prohibits religious discrimination, including against people who change their religion. Human rights also protects against discrimination on the, bend, on the basis of gender reassignment. There is another aspect, uh, the last one I'll, I'll refer to, to the nervousness surrounding the fluidity of class. Uh, my background is working class. And people are also nervous that class involves sometimes a mobility. But the Indian Supreme Court in Indra Sawney made it very clear that someone cannot keep benefiting from a prohibition on class discrimination. So I find all these arguments against prohibiting class discrimination both within an intersectional approach and outside it uh, without validity. But now I'm beginning to see a sea change in attitude for very tragic reasons. Firstly, because as Shreya eloquently referred to, the avoidable tragedy of Grenville Tower. Secondly, with the impact of COVID-19, where we've seen frontline workers in many countries, many of them working class, holding up economies and providing the essentials for life. In relation to Grenville Tower, class was also a dominant theme, as well as all the other inequalities that Shreya referred to. And this played into the ignoring of the well-documented concerns of the residents, which I think gives rise to not only a breach of the uh, Human Rights Act, but also the European Convention on Human Rights. In the Royal Borough of Kensington, both Marshall and Bourdieu's ideas of cultural, economic and social capital played out clearly. They were perceived the residents of having little economic, cultural and social capital, and therefore their safety concerns were ignored. So class discrimination has serious consequences which can lead to a violation of the right to life. And this is further evidenced by World Health Organization data, for example, on the different life expectancies of residents in neighboring boroughs in Glasgow, for example, which has a 10 year difference in life expectancy between the neighboring poorer and wealthier boroughs. Class discrimination is also unrecognized and unacknowledged even where it impacts on the very structures and remedies of international human rights law. To take one example, which I call the nature of the legal order of the Council of Europe, civil and political rights has the European Court of Human Rights uh, delivering uh, binding judgments, whereas socioeconomic rights only has the European Social Charter to hear complaints with a committee. Uh, you have to, a state, fully ratify the European Convention on Human Rights with reservations, whereas it's only partial ratification with reservations of the revised European Social Charter. So we have a deprioritization of socioeconomic rights, which I think partly reflects uh, class prejudice. Uh, this has not been acknowledged. Now, it shouldn't even be necessary to prohibit class discrimination expressly 
all human rights treaties are sufficiently broadly drawn to prohibit class discrimination in their equality clauses, but they've not been interpreted even within an intersectional approach to prevent class discrimination, except in rare dissenting decisions such as Garib. If we look at Article 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights, it enshrines a right not to be discriminated against on any grounds such as social origin, property, birth or other status. And this list of prohibited grounds is similar in all other human rights treaties. So the prohibitions of discrimination are not exhaustive. They allow for an inclusion and a reading in of a prohibition of class discrimination, at least into social origin, birth or other status, but this has not occurred. I want to make it clear that I'm not arguing for a prohibition of only working class discrimination, but all forms of discrimination against class. As I said, there's been a sea change. So at the global level, we have the recognition of a specific, often ignored class, including in intersectional We're just a bit short of time, so if you could wrap up a little bit, that would be great. I, I am, sorry. So we have the 2018 UN Declaration on the Rights of the Child. So class continues to be important. It's important to politics. Canada even has a Minister for Middle Class Prosperity. So I don't know what happens to the other classes. And it's time for law to step up to the plate and expressly prohibit all forms of class discrimination. Thank you. Thanks, Geraldine. Um, right, we're going to turn then to Megan Campbell. Okay, uh, to echo everybody else, thank you both to Shreya and Peter for pulling together this amazing edit collection, and to Kate and Montevero for all the technical and chairing, and great work chairing. So my chapter uh, looks at rality and sexual reproductive health rights. And one of the things that's really interesting about intersectionality and thinking about this project and intersectionality and human rights is that moving away from discrimination law, we can start to think about intersectionality divorced from the canon of grounds that we often see in the texts of human rights instruments and look at other non-traditional identities and characteristics and how do they impact and influence the realization of um, human rights. And so I'll be looking at morality and gender and sexual and reproductive health rights. So when we think about morality, which is a hard word to say, um, everyone's jurisdiction probably has a set of stereotypes about rural spaces. And often those stereotypes are you know, socially backward, uh, frozen in time, politically conservative, or very, very patriarchal. But rural spaces are, are not a monolith. They're not just a set of stereotypes, but they're very diverse and they can have different meanings in different countries and different spaces. So there's lots of different understandings and ways of living in a rural space and a lot of them have different relationships with urban spaces. But like Geraldine pointed out with class, there definitely is a lack of definition and clarity and there are boundary disputes about what is or isn't rural. But there are two consistent factors. One is a distance from urban centers and the other is a lower population density. So there's more space and less people. And these hallmark factors of rurality uh, do impact on the realization of sexual and reproductive health rights for women and girls. And urban assumptions on how to fulfill sexual and reproductive health rights can be reproduced sort of unthinkingly in uh, rural spaces to the detriment of the enjoyment of sexual and reproductive health rights. And there are lots of different and overlapping ways that rurality impacts on sexual and reproductive health. The uh, strength of patriarchal norms is a recurring theme um, throughout much of the CEDAW committee's work on um, rurality. There was just a great inquiry report released just two weeks ago on South Africa and domestic violence. And the committee pays you know, specific attention to how living in a rural community and the strength of patriarchal norms impacts on, on domestic violence. But the two I'll look at in the brief time I have that are kind of unique to rurality are the lack of confidentiality and the limited sexual and reproductive health rights, um, the reproductive services. So often in rural communities, there might be only one place to access contraception and it'll be staffed by somebody you know in the community and the lack of privacy and the anonymity can make accessing contraception um, really embarrassing, especially for young girls who feel their uh, sexuality is really monitored by the community they live in. Teachers will often report feeling vulnerable in the community if the sex education they deliver in schools doesn't really conform to the community's expectations. And students report feeling uncomfortable getting sex education from their regular teacher because they see this person out and about in the community. So the stigma and shame that 
often attaches to sexual reproductive health rights for women is compounded in rural spaces by the lack of privacy, the lack of confidentiality in accessing services. There's also a lack of confidentiality when reporting gender-based violence. Again, because of the kind of the close nature of many of these communities. The other reoccurring theme is just a limited access to sexual reproductive health rights services. There often is no one who can provide abortion services or conscious of conscientious objection acts as a de facto ban on abortion in rural areas, as might be only one doctor in the community who could perform it, but they conscious, conscientiously object. It can be cost prohibitive to get into urban spaces to access sexual reproductive health rights services. And uh, Michelle Statz and Lisa Pruitt do a really interesting article about looking at migrant women and, and um, having to travel within Texas to get to abortion services and their fear of that because of their undocumented um, status. So there's multiple layers of intersectionality in rural areas in relation to sexual reproductive health rights. Rurality is also a risk factor for maternal mortality and morbidity because there's a lack of investment in rural health, maternal health care, and there's often inadequate or expensive infrastructure leaks. Uh, so uh, links, pardon me, transport's expensive, or there's no really emergency uh, referral systems. The social isolation and the lack of uh, distance from shelters can compound the harms of, of domestic violence. So there's, rurality just pops up over and over again in sexual reproductive health rights for women. It really is a strong explanatory factor for why their rights are not being fulfilled. But most human rights instruments make very, very little mention of rurality, with the one exception of the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW. Uh, Article 14 specifically singles out and creates an obligation on the state to guarantee the equal rights of rural women. Article 14 has an interesting drafting history. Uh, there's some who argue it was really, rural was a placeholder for Global South. So it was actually really supposed to be an obligation about um, larger sort of economic equality or the international economic order, which was in vogue at the time of drafting. But interestingly, it does contain specific obligations um, requiring the state to ensure that rural women and girls have adequate healthcare facilities, including information on family planning. CEDAW has uh, an interesting history of intersectionality as well. The text has been criticized for not being particularly intersectional and kind of approaching women as a monolith, like a white sort of 1970s style uh, feminist woman. But the work of the CEDAW committee has been really important in intersectionalizing, intersectionalizing CEDAW and they take women as a, a sort of pivot point and look at the a confluence of factors in relation to sex and gender to help understand why women are experiencing discrimination in their human rights. And they often go beyond the traditional grounds. They look at literacy, prisoner status. They also look at sort of events like conflict or climate change. And they have paid attention uh, to ruralness. And it's using the many outputs it has to consider how ruralness intersects with gender in relation to sexual reproductive health rights. And it's encouraging to know that they've released a general recommendation that looks just at, at um, ruralness. It could be critiqued for maybe focusing, uh, repeating the drafting history of focusing mostly on the global south and not considering maybe ruralness and how it manifests in the global north. But it is, in across the outputs the CEDAW committee does, it is really attentive to the structural dimensions and is constantly encouraging states to invest in rural sexual reproductive health services. You know, just fund these healthcare type needs that women have. Also ensuring better transport links between urban and rural spaces and increasing women's economic independence so that women have the resources to either access urban spaces or to have the independence and, and sort of power or social political clout to demand these services within their communities. Less attention is being paid to the other theme I mentioned earlier about the lack of privacy. So the committee isn't really talking about how to deliver sex ed in uh, remote or close knit communities or how to ensure that sex ed is comprehensive and human rights based when there is maybe this community pushback. Nor does it really talk a lot about contraception and how to ensure privacy and confidentiality when rural women want to access contraception. So there's still a bit of work to be done by the CEDAW committee to fully intersectionalized sexual reproductive health rights, but it is making some strides in thinking about a, a ground identity that's been kind of overlooked in human rights discourse by paying attention to how geography and ruralness really do impact on a really uh, you know, cornerstone of women's equality. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. And thank you, Sheree and everyone for a great, great session.
Uh, thanks, Megan. That was really interesting. Made me think about the connections between that and the papers on education, for example, because there's no doubt that issues of kind of rural location are, are you know, very intersectional in terms of access to education in, in a range of ways. Um, so that's been a really interesting set of conversations. I'm now going to turn to Peter, who's going to make a few concluding remarks before we open to Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, I think that everyone would much rather hear a Q&A session than, than listen to me. So I'm going to be very brief um, and cover some of the ground that Shreya already covered. But I just want to uh, say a few acknowledgements and a few thanks to so many people who've been involved. Uh, so first of all, on a personal level, I just want to thank uh, Shreya, who has been amazing throughout this process. Uh, I'm sure many people on this uh, webinar will know that over the past decade, Shreya has been researching uh, the issue of uh, intersectionality from a number of different levels. Uh, her much celebrated uh, book in 2019, Intersectional Discrimination, uh, has been rightly lauded. Um, and in the last six months, her work has been, uh, has been uh, cited by both the, the Indian Supreme Court and the South African Constitutional Court. Um, so, and so for me, it's just been a huge, huge privilege um, to be able and to have the opportunity to work with somebody who, who is truly redefining her field. So, so thank you, Shreya. Um, the Society of Legal Scholars uh, owes, is owed a, a huge debt of gratitude. Um, in 2018, they agreed to fund uh, a conference on this issue that we ran at the University of Bristol. Um, 35, I think 40 people, uh, many of whom are on this call today, attended. It was a really rich discussion of the issues that ultimately went into the book and, and really shaped our own thinking and the thinking of, of many of those who contributed. So we want to thank uh, the SLS and we also want to thank all those people who came uh, to that conference, who generously shared uh, their viewpoints, their perspectives uh, and their own insights, uh, which really went uh, towards, as I say, making the book. Shreya and I both started our academic careers and I remain at the University of Bristol, um, who hosted that conference and who have been endlessly supportive, uh, both in terms of helping us to put together that event, but also in terms of colleagues supporting the book, uh, reading over um, uh, uh, sort of uh, proposals, uh, chapters, and, and constantly giving her advice. So I know that both Trey and I would want uh, to thank them and the law school. Um, I and Trey also want to thank uh, the Faculty of Law at Oxford, uh, the Bonavero Institute, uh, particularly Kate and Gayatri, who have organized this event today, and Kate for chairing, thank you so much to the Oxford Human Rights Hub, Megan and Sandy, who not only have supported this event, uh, but have contributed chapters and helped and, uh, and, and, and sort of contributed to those books, right? So thank you so, so much for making this event happen. Um, we have been really fortunate uh, in this book to have an incredible publisher uh, right from the beginning uh, who have been uh, really sensitive to all of the issues that we want to discuss to our process and actually then uh, to dealing with the delays brought about by the COVID pandemic and ensuring, and people in the UK will understand this, that the book came out in time for REF 2021, which was quite important. So I want to thank uh, deeply uh, all of our colleagues at heart uh, during the editing process. That was Sinead Maloney, Sasha Jowett and Tom Adams, and more recently, uh, Rosamond Jubber, Jubber and Emma Platt, who have been involved in disseminating and marketing the book and giving us advice to write that. This seminar today, this book launch will be available. The recording will be available, not only through the Bonavera Institute, but also on Hart's uh, website. And Hart have very generously uh, provided a discount for the book, uh, which I know is available in the Q&A. Um, so thank you to Hart. And then I finally just want to say a huge and a really heartfelt debt of gratitude uh, to all of the contributors to this book uh, who have really been beyond generous uh, with their time. Um, many of you know Freya and I are, are at the beginning or I think we still fall within the ideas of early career researchers and so therefore have been really grateful um, to Gautier, to Sandy, to Megan, to Geraldine, um, to, uh, to, to, to Colm, um, uh, and for all of to, to, to speaking today, I particularly also want to thank uh, Professor Florona de Landris, uh, who is uh, on the, at the webinar, but, but not presenting today due to uh, existing commitments. Um, Fiona 
not only wrote an incredibly interesting and rich chapter which dealt with uh, an issue that was quite close to my heart, uh, looking, taking an intersectional lens at the recent referendum on reproductive health care in Ireland, but has also been hugely supportive of this project. So to all of our, our, our authors, um, thank you so much for contributing. Thank you so much for your generosity uh, and for continuing uh, to, to support this project. So thank you so much. Thanks very much, uh, Peter. And I also want to apologize for Fiona um, for not including her at the start, but really pleased she's able to be here today. Um, so now there are um, a series of really interesting questions in the Q&A. And for those of you who haven't yet put your question, please do so. I'm going to start with the question was put to Gautier, who has put an answer, just in case he might like to elaborate on that answer. So the question was really how his structural disadvantage approach uh, would interact with the politics of the social movements in relation to marginalized groups. And the question refers in particular to disabled community who had been largely neglected by mainstream stream international human rights law until the adoption of the um, UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Um, so whether you want to comment on your answer to that, Gautier, because I thought it was an, an interesting question. I'm going to pick up the other two that are there at the moment and then just give people an opportunity around the panel to respond as they'd like. Um, the next question is, relates to the fact that the sort of the language of uh, critical race theory and intersectionality have been under attack in the USA and Canada in recent years and whether contributors here see the work that they have done as being responsive to that political context. And then the last question is um, how intersectionality impacts upon human rights adjudication and Callum obviously spoke a bit about that. Um, so whether then seeing it as a, or stating it as a tool of analysis or declaring it um, uh, as to be, uh, you know, uh, recognizing it as part of deciding whether there's been a breach of a right of non-discrimination. And does the idea of intersectionality make uh, any impact on the remedy? Um, and how would the remedy tackle the, the challenge of intersectionality? Uh, or is the question really about rights violation? And I think this is a really interesting question because uh, it does seem to me that in some ways, if we recognize that what intersectionality points us to is that the difference, and uh, Shreya talks about this in, in her introductory chapter, the difference which all human pe people, human beings are, then remedy needs to sort of recognize that and may well be that some notions of sort of asymmetry and difference need to feed into the remedy uh, section of the of a court's analysis. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to start by going to you, Gautier, um, and then we will um, move around the other panelists and I'll pick up other questions as they arise. Yes, uh, th thank you, Sonia, for this question. And I think, <laughs> to be very honest, uh, it, it would deserve at least another chapter, perhaps even a book. Um, it's a very wide question and 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 I, I, I think it's something we need to, to take much more seriously in any future discussion. Uh, uh, and you, you, you mentioned uh, one thing totally correctly, is that uh, for disabled people, there was a specific uh, uh, question because they were very in, uh, um, invisible in the international framework of human rights. So uh, uh, it was, uh, and actually the, 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 the movement a, co a coherent uh, disability argument started with, with with the negotiation with the first steps of the negotiation with this convention when, when in um, uh, about in 2003 when, when Mexico uh, made a proposal to have a convention a lot of people disabled people were completely taken uh, by surprise so they said let's put our difference aside and get to, let's get together to 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 push this forward and to be honest uh, uh, things have not been easy it's, there is not much uh, uh, discussion about it, but inside the, 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 the disability rights group, there were some very difficult compromises to make. Uh, to make. But they've made them at the expense of, of course, the voice of certain uh, disabled groups. So in the end, so that, that's what the, 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 in, the identity politics within disability. Um, so in the end, you have a convention that, that, that relates to, that, that takes a whole group of people but in fact, inside, it, it deals with a characteristic that, 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 that is associated with very different experiences. Um, and and, and it, it, it went through, but 
then you're totally right. The, the question then is how far do we go? And, and maybe, uh, I'm just thinking aloud, the, the, inter the, 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 the focus on intersectionality has uh, given some fuel to uh, states who say, well, stop with this kind of group specific movements. Because if we continue to do that, uh, and now the next ones are, are, are basically blocked. There are two treaties on the table, but no states want to move on with them. Uh, and perhaps intersectionality, that's the double-edged sword of intersectionality, says an argument to say we need to stop that. So, uh, and, and I remember, and I'll try now to, to go back to your, to your specific question. Uh, so what is a success? Yes, in a way, because it, articula it shows how you can articulate human rights, but it, it causes fragmentation, yes. How, how can the movement answer this? Um, and uh, I remember at, in Bristol, I, I think Sandra Friedman asked me the same question, and, and I regretted my answer at that time. Uh, because I, I found it maybe too simplistic. Uh, I've been thinking about it for the last two years. And, and, and I think that to, what I would say today is, is, is perhaps um, that, and, and that I think that's something very important even for all the communities, uh, I, I speak about the UN, who, who are lobbying, writing shadow reports uh, around the different committees, is to look beyond these group specific uh, treaties to use them as a stepping stone to understand how rights apply and are experienced within specific context, but move away, focus on the rights, they run them more on the groups. Um, and that will require stronger links uh, uh, between uh, uh, those who are in, 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 in focusing on different uh, 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 groups uh, and, and others. And it's not always easy. I take one example, for instance, again, disabled children, uh, well, both the, the, the disability movement and child rights movement will think about them very differently and will place them somewhere in their agenda that does not place them at the top of their, of their priorities or that adds to other priorities and dialogue is not uh, uh, always happening um, easily. I hope this gives, I think, I think this doesn't give much answer to your question, but I think we need to really to, to, to see how it can translate into a social movement uh, uh, action. Thank you. Thanks, Gautier. Very interesting answer about the intersection between sort of specified treaties and general human rights protection. Shreya, do you want to respond to the second question in particular, which is the question about uh, the criticism of the uh, language, as it were, critical race theory and intersectionality and, you know, how this work may interact with those critiques. Thanks, thanks, Kate, and thanks to Yuvraj for the question. Thanks for joining today, Yuvraj. Um, so I think one of the things for us who are not, not based in North America is that we, we're slightly insulated from a lot of the political context um, of the way in which intersectionality is, is, is received, right? So um, I think our project is, is responding to that political context, perhaps by doing what I think is, is done far less by not giving that political context or, which, 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 which is a backlash against intersectionality and critical race theory, not giving it, giving it much air. And I think the reason why this is a good strategy is that so much of how intersectionality theory and, interse and the field of intersectionality studies has developed has been through the critiques because critiques have become the way to take up intersectionality theory. So I think responding constantly to the backlash can really hamper what we want to do with intersectionality. But I also think there are enough foot soldiers doing the important work with intersectionality outside of law already. So I think we need more foot soldiers doing this work in human rights law, sort of responding to the question Monica's posed again, but what is intersectionality doing in adjudication? I think this is what we wanted to pass through by really sort of skipping a lot of the political debate around is intersectionality even worth it? Um, and, and really going to what work does it do in, 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 in human rights adjudication. Can I quickly briefly mention the, the, the remedy point which Monica brings up? I think one of the things that often happens with the way intersectionality is brought up in human rights law is through the remedy. Um, and, and oftentimes intersectionality is taken up only in the last part of 
of, of judgments um, where intersectionality is brought up as a reason for giving exceptional damages or compensation. And that's, that's pretty much where intersectionality stops. I think we want to start with asking different questions by putting the question of to judges to think about whose rights have been violated, what evidence is there of intersectional violations, and what, what difference does the ed evidence make to the test of violation being applied, and then move on to remedy. So I think one of the innovative ways in which remedy has been thought about in intersectional terms is by the South African Constitution Court again, which thinks about intersectionality in justifying a retrospective remedy, because the group which was whose, whose human rights were being violated was an intersectional group, and they had been historically discriminated against. So black women, thinking about whether a retrospective remedy was necessitated, was justified by the intersectional harm that was brought forth by the MICA. So I think th that is an extremely innovative use of, of intersectionality. And I would hope much more happens at that end rather than just using intersectionality to scale up damages. I think that's a pretty reductionist way of, of, of doing human rights. I think human rights reasoning in, in adjudication is, is, is sort of spread throughout the labyrinth of reasoning rather than just at the end. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Ray. I'm going to just supplement with a few more questions before I go around the panel. So the next one, which also relates to remedy, is a question about the Paris versus Trinity College Dublin decision and the non-retrospectivity of the of an order in relation to pension benefits. So when people are commenting on pensions, if they're familiar with the case, they might like to comment on that. And, and then there's a question directly to Geraldine and her argument about the importance of including class as a ground of um, prohibited ground of discrimination and whether you know why she thinks it's uh, there's been such reluctance whether it's a matter of legal culture and the questioner points out that the American declaration since 1969 has included socio-economic status um, and there have been jurisprudence out of the inter-American court on that so just whether you want to comment on that Geraldine um, and then the last question which is an important one is how we manage intersectionality in places where human rights are not uh, widely protected and respected and whether there's any way in which we can utilize thinking about intersectionality in such concepts. So what I thought I would do is I'll just go around the table following the order which we went in with people who haven't yet responded. So that would start with Cullum and then go to Sandy, um, Geraldine and then Megan. And if you, bearing in mind the time, if you'd like two minutes, very quick answers to pick up out of any of those questions, what you'd like to talk to. Uh, okay, I'll go very, very, very quickly. Um, intersectionality, a tremendous analytical tool when understood properly, as opposed to the caricature that's doing the rounds. Um, it is interesting, and I make this point in my chapter, that um, its value as an analytical tool has been widely recognised. Um, it's interesting how little intersectionality has been openly and explicitly taken up by courts over the years. There's a resistance to that. In my chapter, I put forward a theory linking back to something that Gauthier has said about there being a reluctance, a, a, a fear that if you delve, if you go too far down the rabbit hole of intersectionality, as I put it, that you will end up making endless fact specific, contextual specific decision making. And it, would be, it becomes very, very difficult to maintain doctrinal stability institutional legitimacy in that context. You become a freewheeling mechanism for delivering justice rather than a court applying more general doctrine. That I think is the concern which makes courts and judges and often conventional legal academics and lawyers reluctant to engage too much in intersectionality. As I argue in the chapter, I think those concerns are overblown and um, they are something to be taken into account but I think there is a way to mobilize intersectionality effectively without disappearing down the rabbit hole. But read my chapter for all the uh, <laughs> all the answers to your excellent questions. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Callum. Uh, Sandy. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I wanted to respond briefly to to Monica's very helpful question about remedies, uh, following on from Shreya's point. Um, I think that the remedy. Once we look at, for example, the right to education and the, and the different streams of cases that I mentioned, if the remedy around the right to education, say, if you only focus on race, then your remedy is 
desegrega uh, desegregation. Um, and yet that is an extremely limited remedy if you see it only as a response to de, de jure segregation. But if you see it as both poverty and uh, segregation, then you take a very different view of the remedy. The remedy must include uh, improving the uh, actual uh, schooling for everyone, not just desegregating, but making sure that more resources are given and that that will uh, come with it um, a, a prohibition on both race discrimination and discrimination on grounds of poverty. And the same is true for uh, exclusion, say, of pregnant learners, that if you only see it as a denial of the right to education and you leave out the gendered aspect, then your remedy is, well, just um, allow these uh, learners to come back into the school, but you don't take into account the stereotypes and stigma which is accompanied uh, accompanies the fact that it's because of their gender uh, that they are disadvantaged and, and also because often of their race that they're subject to violence, gender-based violence and racialized gender-based violence. So I think the remedy then with an intersectionality analysis is more far reaching and could uh, address more of the issues, more of the dimensions in one go. Thanks, Sandy. Um, Geraldine. Yes, socioeconomic status omits all the identity and cultural aspects associated with class and class discrimination. So uh, people are proud of their working class heritages, but not of coming from a low socioeconomic status. And the terminology has to reflect dignity. You're right about the three decisions post 2015 of the uh, uh, Inter-American uh, Court. Those decisions uh, are uh, very important and, and often the Inter-American system leads the way. However, in relation to whether the restraints on other courts are in relation to uh, textual uh, constraints, yes, or uh, cultural issues, yes. So it's a combination of the two and class is invisible even within the uh, inter-American system. Thank you. Megan. I think uh, to echo everybody else, I, I also agree that intersectionality is a really important analytical tool. And we can see in some recent cases from the UK Supreme Court where they're not fully embracing intersectionality. There's a case about um, the work conditionalities and the benefit cap and they are, analyze it just on lone parenthood, but ignore the gender aspects of lone parenthood. And because of that, then they don't really see the discrimination in telling single lone mothers and fathers, just, just go find a job and someone else will take care of your kids, I guess, while you're working. They, they, they can't see that, um, that the, how gender caring and parenting are going to impact on being able to find paid employment. And then, then that kind of essentially screws up their analysis. So they don't have a full sense of intersectionality. They can't see the discrimination. So it's, it's both a kind of a, a diagnostic analytical tool, I think as Colin said. And it is also important in crafting remedies. And, and this is where uh, the CEDAW committee has some success, not, not always fully, it can always push itself further, but uh, the inquiry into indigenous women and the high rates of violence against them, the intersectionality of indigenous poverty and gender points to really creative remedies to get at these larger structures that are perpetuating violence, like the child welfare services and, and how women, indigenous women interact with that, or how Indigenous women are more likely to hitchhike. So you to actually address violence, you need to have good transport links between these you know, 500 kilometer stretches of Barron Road in, in British Columbia. So intersectionality can really provide creative space or creativity with families as well, other than just like strengthen your police services. It can really try to give us the tools to see this is the structure that needs to be really addressed if we're going to address this human rights violation. Great. Well, thanks very much to all of you for your really interesting and concise answers. And that, that brings us to the end of this book launch. Just to remind you that you will find the, um, the link to the publisher's information on the website together with the code to get a discount on your order. So make sure you get that before we, um, we finish the Zoom call this evening. And to thank all of you who have attended. It's been a, a wonderful group for really interesting questions. And of course, to thank our panelists and, uh, and authors who have uh, introduced us to this book and made us realize why it is so important. So thank you very much everyone for being here and for speaking and wish you all well, keep well and safe and don't forget to download the information about the book before you sign off.
Good night. We can also can thank the Institute for this. Thank you. Ah, it's a great pleasure. <laughs> bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, bye. everyone. Bye. bye.